welcome to The Buzz. On this episode, we're celebrating wildlife. We'll be learning about one animal that is a top predator, while the other is the largest prey. Both get a lot of attention in our preserves. So let's get ready to hunt with the coyotes and run with the deer on this episode of The Buzz. Coyotes have been part of our culture and our natural landscapes for a long time. The Native Americans would tell stories about the coyote, either being helpful to humans teaching us lessons or being a clever trickster. Today, finding a wild coyote isn't too much of a challenge as they're pretty adaptable to be in our preserves and in our cities. However, they can be a little misunderstood, so let's take the time to learn how to care about coyotes. Coyotes are part of the canine family. They're much smaller than wolves, but much larger than foxes. Picture a medium-sized dog ranging from 20 to 40 pounds. Their fur color can vary greatly, having different kind of color combinations throughout their different habitats across the country. But generally in our area, you'll see coyotes looking like this, with grays, tans, a little bit of black, with a white underbelly. Plus, look for these pointed ears, a long snout, and yellow eyes. Their bushy tail also tells a story. One Potawatomi legend says that the tail is black because it was singed while trying to bring fire to humans. This black tip is a good characteristic to keep in mind when trying to compare it with other canines. Red foxes have the same kind of paintbrush shape of the tail, but theirs is tipped in white. Also, coyotes will walk and run, usually with their tail pointed down, whereas wolves will have their tail straight out. Coyotes can be found across North and Central America. Originally, they were only native to the plains and deserts of the Western United States. However, over time, humans have displaced bigger predators like cougars and wolves, making a niche open for coyotes to fill. Now they're highly adaptable, being able to be found in grasslands, forests, swamps, and prairies. Coyotes still have the instincts to avoid people. So even in urban areas, they like to be in wooded areas with enough cover to hide. They will be more nocturnal in urban areas because they're trying to avoid humans as much as possible. Coyotes are apex predators, meaning that they're the top of the food chain with no natural predators of their own. By looking at their teeth, we can kind of get clues on what they're eating. If you look at their canines, they're super large and pointy. Even their back molars here come to a point. This all shows us that this animal is a carnivore. Studies support this by showing 90% of their diet consists of mammals. The Urban Coyote Project reports that majority of that is rodents, with deer and rabbit coming in second and third. Now when times get tough, coyotes can be opportunistic feeders, eating fruits as well. Hunting is done either in the early morning or in the late evening. And even though they may live in family groups, they usually hunt solo, unless they're tackling something bigger like a deer. First, they have to locate a rodent using their senses of smell and hearing. They have to be as sneaky as possible when they're following the trail. To make as little noise as possible, they will even walk on their tiptoes. Once they find the rodent they're stalking, they'll stiffen up and then pounce. A pack of coyotes is more like a family group. They work together to defend their territory and protect the den, especially when raising pups. The pack includes five to six adults, including an alpha male and female, plus the current year's pups. Genetic analysis of coyote packs has found that all the members of the packs are close relatives, except the alphas. The number of individuals in the pack depends on how much food is available in the area and how active humans are hunting and trapping. Breeding season starts in late February. Only the alpha pair will mate. Coyotes are pretty loyal to each other, mating for life, only finding a new partner if the other one dies. Come April, the female will start looking for dens. 
They can make their own den, but they prefer repurposing a burrow used by a raccoon, skunk, or a fox. Dens are only used to raise the pups. A litter size can range from four to seven pups. Come late summer, these young coyotes will start venturing out on their own. Some will go solo and look for a new pack or start one of their very own, while others will stick in their pack to raise the next round of pups. When talking about coyotes, I usually get asked about koi dogs or koi wolves. These are hybrids, mixing a domestic dog or a wolf with a coyote. And while koi dogs happen, their populations just aren't very significant. Male coyotes are very involved in taking care of the pups while bringing them food and defending their dens. Our domestic dogs don't really take part in parental care, so those koi dogs don't have high survival rates. Another factor is that coyotes are seasonal breeders, making the timing a little tricky. As for koi wolves, this is a common name used for a subspecies of coyote, also known as eastern coyotes. Genetic testing has found small traces of wolf DNA within these coyotes. However, no evidence suggests that we have these coyotes in our area. We actually have the western coyote subpopulation. The scientific name for coyote is Canis latrans, which translates into barking dog. This name is pretty appropriate because the coyote is known as the most vocal mammal in North America. One study classified 11 different kinds of vocalizations, ranging from yips to growls to howls. The different sounds can mean different things. For example, growling could be used to threaten a nearby animal whereas howling could be used to check in after a solo hunting trip. Howling can also be used to defend their territories or check in with one another because the coyotes can recognize their individual voices. It's common to think that coyotes howl at the moon. While this howling does occur at night, it's just a happy coincidence if there's a full moon or not. Calling isn't their only form of communication. They can also use body language using different gestures or facial cues. Plus, to further communicate the stay off my lawn, they can urinate on trees, shrubs, and leave scat behind. Because coyotes are highly adaptable, there is a chance you may have a run-in with one. A nuisance coyote is one that is causing harm to you or your pet. And the best way to avoid this behavior is to not feed wildlife. When we feed wildlife, it's getting these animals less and less afraid of humans. This makes coyotes feel a little bit bolder, getting closer to you and maybe trying your small pet as a prey item. Even though it seems like providing food would help the animal, it actually leads them down to a path where they'll probably get killed in the end. If you notice a curious coyote getting a little too close, here's a few tips to keep them at bay. Make sure your garbage cans have tight lids Try to clean up underneath your bird feeders and feed all your pets indoors. If you're still concerned about your small animals, consider adding a four foot tall fence deep enough where the coyote can't dig underneath. And if you have chickens, make sure they have a secure enclosure to go into at night. For the most part, seeing a coyote in your neighborhood is no reason for alarm. These are actually a good sign because they're helping our ecological health of our yards by keeping our rodent population and even the geese population under control. We are still learning more about coyotes every day. A lot of this research comes from our own backyard of coyotes in the Chicago land area. The Urban Coyote Research Project began in 2000 and is still going strong with the mission of researching their ecology and behavior so we can learn how to coexist. I believe we can foster a positive relationship with these animals by appreciating their place in the food chain, their loyal family bonds, and their socializations at night with all those howls. Do you want to do more to protect nature? inspire discovery, and connect people with the great outdoors? You can when you support the Nature Foundation of Will County. 
This nonprofit charity raises funds through support from donors, organizations, and the business community to help support the Forest Preserve District of Will County's mission. The foundation helps various initiatives take flight. It helps the Forest Preserve secure national touring exhibitions. It pays for new amenities such as campground welcome stations and bike repair stations on Will County's regional trails. It assists with the costs associated with land stewardship, which includes equipment for volunteer workdays and seeding of native plants to restore the land to its original state, which helps enhance not only your outdoor experiences, but local wildlife as well. There's a lot more work to be done, and we're just getting started. Roll with us on this adventure and become a champion for nature so future generations can appreciate and explore everything Mother Nature has to offer. Donate today at willcountynature.org. Have you not been doing much of this the past few years? Or is your garage a hot mess and you need to free up some space? Then donate your wheels at our Recycle Your Bicycle program. Bikes of all ages and conditions are accepted. Working Bikes, a nonprofit, picks up the bikes and makes any necessary repairs. They get them back on the road, distributing the bikes both locally and abroad for people who need low-cost transportation. We set a program record last fall with 147 bikes collected. Help us cruise on past that number and get more people moving on two wheels. Get more details at reconnectwithnature.org. Buzz episodes, we've met a few members of our very large team, from our executive director to a wildlife ecologist and a few interpretive naturalists. But there are so many more people and departments that keep the Forest Preserve operating. One of those departments is the police. Our district police are Illinois state certified law enforcement professionals. Their duties include investigating and handling complaints, issuing citations, and handling law enforcement problems in the preserves. They also conduct safety checks on the Forest Preserve's 129 miles of trails. They coordinate crime prevention activities, and they recruit volunteers for the Trail Sentinel program. One side of the police that the public may not know is that they participate in a variety of charity events. In the past three years, they've raised $30,000 for the Special Olympic Illinois by participating in the law enforcement torch run, cop on the rooftop, a plane pull, and this month's polar plunge. This year's Polar Plunge is at Braidwood Recreation Club. In order to participate, individuals or teams have to gather pledges from family, friends, and colleagues to lock in their spot. All proceeds go to Special Olympics Illinois, which assists athletes in all year round training and competitions. This is, this is great, you know it's cold out there, but this is a great feeling for a great cause, and uh, I actually can't wait just to jump in this water. So it just, like stuff like that, just like good motivation, just and then to see the look on the, the Special Olympics athletes' faces, and knowing that you know, our little con contribution to this helps ha help them in a huge way. You know, with the sun out, it's not that bad. I, you know, I think, I'm, I'm assuming the water is warmer than the air right now, so I think going in might be okay, just coming out might be the problem. But hey, again, it's for a great cause, and I'm happy to do it. No need to wait for the next event. You can help us support Special Olympics Illinois by donating today. And help me cheer on our officers as they take the plunge. Well, how was it? Oh, cold! <laughs> Not as cold as I thought it was going to be. It's for an amazing cause, well worth it. Yeah. Absolutely. 
I'm just happy that we can be able to participate in something like this. Uh, this is my first plunge, but I've been do I've been trying to take ice baths at home to prepare for this. <laughs> but uh, did it work? Uh, no, you can't prepare for something like this. No. Yeah. And now I can't feel my toes. Yeah, <laughs> That's the worst part of the peak. I am so proud of all of our officers who took the icy plunge and for all the day-to-day -day work that they do in our preserves. They are a vital part of the district, helping with our mission to protect our preserve visitors as well as our natural resources. And doing these charity events is just one way they help the community. Keep an eye out for their annual National Night Out event coming this summer. And don't be shy. When you're out in the preserves and see them, make sure to say hello. explorers feel more comfortable in the woods, I always start with this question. What is the largest animal that lives here? Sometimes it takes a few answers. I hear bears, wolves, coyotes, but to their surprise, it's an herbivore, not a carnivore that claims this prize. It's also Illinois state mammal. Do you know the answer? It is white-tailed deer. This puts my new explorers at ease because we know deer to be shy and nervous animals. If you are a quiet observer, you may be lucky enough to catch a glimpse of a deer for yourself on your next hike because they're abundant and they're active all year long. White-tailed deer are the only native deer species in Illinois. They're also the most common deer species throughout the United States. They can live in a variety of habitats, including forests and grasslands, plus agricultural and rural areas, and even built up suburban and urban areas. Ideally, they prefer a habitat with dense brush that's easy to move around in, plus it provides cover along forest edges for them to browse for food. Typically, white-tailed deer stand between two to four feet tall, measuring from the shoulders. They weigh somewhere around 90 to 300 pounds. Even though they're our largest animal, when you compare them to their deer relatives, they're actually quite small. Other deer species can stand about five feet tall, and the largest being moose, weighing in at 1,800 pounds. Next is elk, weighing in at 700 pounds. Then lastly, caribou, also known as reindeer, are about 400 pounds. Any idea on how white-tailed deer got their name? Their tails, of course. Their tail has a bright white underside, and it's not just for fashion, it can be used for communication. When the deer are feeling unsettled or startled, they'll flash this white tail and it cues the other deer to stay vigilant. If a threat is too high, they'll start running away. This tail will stay up so that younger deer, called fawns, will be able to follow their mothers through the brush. Deer are considered prey in the food web, so they have some serious moves to escape predators. They have large eyes and ears to see and hear when threats are coming. Once the deer are spotted, they hit the ground running, clocking speeds of 30 miles per hour. If there was a downed tree in their way, no problem. They can jump six to 10 feet high. Water isn't an issue either, as they're good swimmers and have been spotted crossing large rivers and lakes. Their diet will change throughout the seasons. Being herbivores, they're eating plant materials like green leaves and grasses in the spring and summer. In the fall, they'll switch to more crops of corn and soybeans, as well as acorns and other nuts. And in the winter, they're looking for twigs and buds. This 
woody diet would be hard for other animals to digest, but deer are ruminant animals with four chamber stomachs. These chambers have special chemicals inside that can break down all the food. Other ruminant animals that you may be more familiar with include cattle, sheep, and giraffes. Deer have some interesting adaptations to survive the colder months. You may notice a color change from summer to winter. In the summer, they're a lighter reddish brown, whereas in the winter, they're a darker grayish brown. This darker winter color absorbs more sunlight, keeping them warmer in the colder temps. Another warming technique is trapping air in their hollow hair follicles. This is just like our building insulation, how it keeps the warmth in, but the cold out. Lastly, their skin produces an oil, coating the fur, making it water repellent just another layer of defense with the wetter conditions. Male white-tailed deer grow antlers to attract mates. The larger the antlers, the more energy it takes to grow. So when you see a nice large set of antlers, it means that deer is strong and healthy. Peak antler growth usually happens between four to six years old. Genetics will also have a role to play on how large they will get. But if size doesn't seal the deal, then the antlers are used to fight other males to show that they are the supreme choice. They are also a handy accessory to defend themselves from predators. Antlers are made from bone and can grow a quarter inch a day. These are the fastest growing tissues of the animal kingdom. They start growing in spring, and when they first grow, they're covered in velvet. Velvet is a specialized skin that has lots of blood vessels that can transport oxygen and essential nutrients to the area to help them grow quickly. Once the antlers are fully grown, the velvet is cut off from the blood supply and can be rubbed off by the deer using trees or other structures. By fall, they're looking their best for mating season, and by winter, they shed them and the process begins again. You can tell this skull belongs to a male white-tailed deer because of the pedicles here on its head. These little knobs are where the antlers grow. And when they shed, it's kind of like our baby teeth. When we lose a baby tooth, it falls out because a new tooth is pushing its way in. So when these antlers are shed, it's because there's a new antler growing in. Mating season is in the fall. Then six months later, the fawns are born. In our area, that typically is around May through June. Does will have one fawn during their first mating year. After that, the does will have two to four fawns every year. These fawns only weigh four to seven pounds, but a few hours after birth, they'll begin to stand. Fawns are born with little white speckles along their backs, and this is great camouflage. The does will leave the fawns in tall grasses or plants while they go look for food. The white speckles look like dots of sunlight hitting the forest floor. Their brown bodies blend right into the ground, and this is very effective. I've walked classes right next to a fawn, and no one noticed, myself included. So if you happen to stumble across a fawn, please leave it alone and give it space. We've seen people petting them. We've even seen people bring them into the nature center for us to help. Don't do this. It's all part of the plan, and the mother will come back. After a month, the fawns will join their mother on food runs. After a year, males will move on and do their own thing, whereas the females will stay with the mother for another two years. Because of their grazing nature, deer can have a huge impact on what the habitat looks like. Generally, they encourage plant growth when foraging on trees. However, if their population is too high, combined with a severe winter, they can be very destructive to the habitat. White-tailed deer not only make a huge impact on the ecosystem, but also on our human lives. Historically, they were a survival staple for Native Americans and early settlers because they used deer for food and also necessary supplies to make blankets, tools, clothes out of their hides and bones. Normally, deer are a key part of the food chain with predators including cougars, bears, and wolves. In our area, these large predators are absent leaving only coyotes and occasionally bobcats that can target young fawns. This leaves humans to be the largest predators, and it makes hunting an important tool to control populations. 
hunting provides an economic boost as well as funding further conservation efforts. White-tailed deer live among us. They're in our preserves and maybe in your own yard. They're our state mammal and have some amazing adaptations to keep their population thriving. So next time you see one, try to stay quiet and observe. Is it a doe with her fawns? Maybe it's a buck with large antlers? Either way, it's always a treat to encounter one of these shy forest friends. Hopefully you learn that supporting coyotes, deer, and even our Forest Preserve police officers makes a huge difference. Predator-prey relationships are really important to keep our ecosystem balanced and running smoothly. If you have any more questions about these animals, please visit our website, reconnectwithnature.org, for all your wildlife researching needs. I hope to see you out sharing your new knowledge with friends, but until then, I'll see you next time on The Buzz.